think we might start. I think a few more people might creep in, but let's get started. Colin, can you hear me okay? Over a lot of noise. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so we have a couple of people who have hearing impairment here, and we're using the hearing aid loop. So if people could try not to do too much rustling, and that would be helpful. That, that, that's better. Okay. But, um, <laughs> I, I should be able to hear only the person speaking into the microphone. Yes. But so, maybe... so the microphone's plugged into the induction loop, is it? I don't know, it's been set up by our technician, but yes. yeah, I think so. Okay, so, so welcome everybody. My name is Mary Wickend and I'm the, the lead on disability research here at IDS. Um, and we wanted to have an event in the week of the International Day of Disabled People. The actual day was on Tuesday but that wasn't a convenient day to have this event for some reasons that some of, some of you will know about. Um, so we're having it today. Um, and in fact, there is a whole week of events going on both in this country and globally in relation to raising awareness about people with disabilities in different places and looking at different issues. So this event is actually linked to lots of other events that are happening across Europe. Um, the European Disability and Development Network. So this event has been publicised within that, ne that network as well because we're trying to show that we're all working together on these kind of issues. So most of the events are probably advocacy events on people with disabilities getting together to do things and we, we're contributing something a little bit more academic though with a bit of a mixture of um, academic research and more advocacy things. So um, I've just put a slide about the European Disability and Development Week there, um, which um, has a slogan, Together for Inclusion, and it basically emphasises the aims of the week uh, in the European group are to try and encourage an inclusive, inclusive approach to sustainable development, to make sure that nobody with disability is left behind, just as the SDG slogan is, no one should be left behind. So making sure that people with disabilities are included in planning and implementation of anything that's being done. Um, and there are also calls for European states and the EU to be properly implementing the UN Convention. So those are some aims that the whole week has, if you like. Okay, so disability work at IDS, as some of you know, is, is quite new. There, ha there was some work on disability done previously, but we, we're a, a relatively new team, we're about a year old, and we're working, most of our work at the moment is focused on two big DFID-funded consortium programmes. Some of you know a lot about those. We're not going to talk about those particularly today, but they both come, both the programmes come under the umbrella Inclusive Futures, Promoting Disability Inclusion. One of the ones that we're involved with is called Inclusion Works, and that's focused particularly on inclusive employment in the formal sector in four countries. So it's trying to look at whether people with disabilities get the opportunity to access employment in the formal sector in U Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, and Bangladesh. The other one is called the DID programme, Disability Inclusive Development, and that has four strands of work. So inclusive education, inclusive health, inclusive livelihoods, and combating um, stigma and dis reducing stigma and discrimination. And that's in Kenya, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Nepal, Jordan, and Tanzania. So you can see we're working in seven different countries. So we don't do much or any work in the UK context, but our fourth speaker, who's not here yet, but will be coming later, is going to talk about the UK context. So we're going to try and span from international to the UK and back and forth a little bit. Okay, so the lineup today um, is four people. Two, the, the second two speakers aren't here yet because they had other commitments. But first of all, we've got Lorraine Wapling, um, who is a disability researcher from UCL and with DFID and is involved in the programme I just mentioned, the DID programme. And then Maria, who's sitting here, who's going to talk about children with disabilities in Ghana. And then the other two, I hope, will come by the time we're ready for them to talk. So um, let's hand over to Lorraine, and you can perhaps introduce yourself a little bit more. Are you all mic'd up? Oops. Uh, you all mic'd up there? Me? 
Okay, thanks very much, Mary. Um, good evening, everyone. Nice to, um, nice to be invited to um, come and talk to you. I think my job is to start big. So um, I guess I'm, I'm going to be looking at sort of more large scale um, ideas and how we can look at the importance of um, data and disaggregation of data um, to improve um, programming. Um, to improve the way that, that projects are developed and implemented. So lots of what I'm going to talk about is, is quite large scale, and then I think um, it's going to get gradually more narrow, I think. So this will be really interesting. So the impact of disability disaggregated data on program decision-making. It's quite difficult to say, actually. So how to solve a sticky problem? This is a, what I call a sticky problem. It really is genuinely difficult. Why collecting disability data is not straightforward. Basically, there are many, many different uh, factors which make trying to disaggregate or collect um, data on disability really difficult, which is why in 2020, practically, we're still talking about how do we collect quantitative data or any data on disability. Why is it so difficult to do that? Okay, well... Basically, why it's important, we need to be collecting disaggregated data because the lack of information really is contributing, I think, to a sense within the development community that disability is not a development problem. So without having that data, then it's very easy for decision makers and practitioners to say, well, it's not a very important problem or it's not a significant problem. And in any case, what's it got to do with, you know, development? That's, that's disabled people. So <clears throat> basically, we need to be disaggregating data and we need to be getting more um, data and information into those decision making fora because we know a few things. And, and particularly those of us that have been working within disability and development for probably too many years. Um, we know that there is a relationship between disability and poverty. Exactly what that relationship is, we're not entirely sure. But there is definitely a correlation between the two. We know that people with disabilities are less likely to be reached by mainstream anti-poverty, mainstream general education programmes Disabled people are, generally speaking, not going to automatically benefit from those, even when the intention is to reach the most marginalised or to be inclusive. Um, we know that persons with disability tend to miss those. We also know, and it's linked, that disabled people are more likely to be socially marginalised. It becomes difficult for people with disabilities to participate in things. The marginalisation and stigma is a factor. Um, so, basically, persons with disabilities are more likely overall to have their human rights denied, even when those rights are built into constitutions, into policies, into programmes, even into what organisations say is their mission. By and large, disabled people around the world, particularly in low-income countries, are being denied basic rights. Okay, so what are the challenges around data? Well, um, basically, disabled people are invisible in most data sets. So when you aggregate up and you get broad data sets, um, it's almost impossible for you to understand what is, what is the issue here in relation to people with disabilities. Part of the issue that we have is that disability from a rights perspective isn't very well understood around the world and amongst practitioners and decision makers. So there is a tendency to think, oh, disability is about a medical thing, or it's a specialist thing, it's not my responsibility. Um, so we still need to do lots and lots of awareness raising to talk about disability as a development issue. Um, we also see that when organisations or programmes start to think about disability, they then tend to sort of homogenize the experiences of disabled people. So they tend to just talk about, and I'm guilty of this too, but you, you tend to just talk about people with disabilities. And in the data, 
often what we see is just a single line saying people with disabilities. We maybe don't even know um, gender, age, or anything. Um, so there is a tendency for this homogenization of experiences. We also lack documented experiences in relation to um, disability inclusion. There's, there's a knowledge gap, an absolute knowledge gap, which I um, talked about at the beginning. So how disabled people experience development is, is something that you know, is not very well known. So including people in, in poverty reduction programs, in social protection programs, in education programs, what is their experience of that? Well, virtually no one is, is, is asking that question. So um, there is an absolute documented, lack of documented evidence around the experiences of people with disabilities. And I think all of those things together mean that we underestimate the impact of disability, that we underestimate the impact it has on development outcomes. We underestimate the, fact, the, the impact that has on countries developing, um, on families, on households, on communities, because it's just invisible. So, okay, fine. So I do my uh, plea for collecting disability disaggregator data, but um, uh, it's a sticky problem. It's incredibly difficult to do. The main challenges are, you know, you, you cannot simply say, do you have a disability? Um, you can, but you're likely, in most contexts, to get very, um, not very accurate data if you simply ask that question. Sometimes people are, are think, well, it's an obvious question, right? You just ask if a person has a disability. But there are so many reasons why that's a bad idea. Um, Many disabilities, are for, these are just a few of the reasons why asking that question doesn't work. Um, many disabilities are not visually obvious, so sometimes, uh, sometimes when uh, surveys are happening, people, people will say, oh yeah, I, I had a look to see how many disabled people there were, or I, I looked to see if they had a disability. Okay, well, most dis disabilities maybe are not even visually obvious. People themselves may not label themselves as having a disability. Lots of reasons why that's the case. Um, it could be because of stigma. It could be because people don't believe that they have a disability. Um, people also maybe say, well, I, I, I've never been officially diagnosed, so I, I can't say that I have a disability, or I don't have a disability ID card, so therefore I don't have a disability. Lots and lots of reasons why someone would perhaps not say that they had a disability. In some places, if you're trying to get information about children with disabilities, for example, and you're asking families, um, carers, households, you know, do you have children with disabilities here? No, we don't have. Because it's shameful, or there, there's, there's some, maybe there's some stigma. So parents don't want to necessarily um, admit that they have a child with a disability. Um, overall, that creates obviously inconsistent data. So when you have sometimes uh, information that comes to you and you see a line where it says uh, prevalence rate of disability, the first thing I ask is, what was the question? How did you get this information? Um, because that will tell you how valid, how reliable that question is likely to be. And up until very recently, data was basically non-comparable. Because so many people were asking the question in so many different ways, it was impossible for us to aggregate information about disability, even prevalence rates, because people are asking the question in so many different ways. It's giving you completely inconsistent information. And then we have the Washington Group, who have solved all of our problems. Mm. <laughs> okay. Well, we're coming closer to being able to have some form of standardised information around disability. Now, this is not without its, um, you know, issues. But before we, you know, say anything about the issues, let's look at why this is really, really important, I think. It's a huge step forward. We have this set of questions called the Washington Group questions, which are uncannily simple. Um, the short set are actually only uh, six questions, and they literally take two minutes. They are so simple. Interesting, they were devised originally to be used in censuses, so they had to be very short. They had to be as reliable as possible. So they picked six very, very simple questions, statements. Um, 
they did it in a way which, which tries to be much more rights-based. So there's no assumptions around physical impairments at all. In fact, the word disability is not used in the question set at all to try and get over some of the um, problems around, you know, what we talked about before, how you define disability. Um, so they've avoided um, anything around defining disability. Um, they have managed to create a set of questions which, if they are asked in the manner prescribed, give you pretty reliable, consistent, comparable data. Okay? And they take less than two minutes. So, what are these amazing questions? If you've not seen them before, definitely worth having a look. They're, this is the short set, so it's very, very short. And what you notice is the word disability is not used at all. It talks about um, uh, difficulty. Okay, so you ask people, do you have a difficulty? Or you maybe don't even have an introductory statement at all. You just say, do you have difficulty seeing, even if you wear glasses? And all you have to do is say, no, no difficulty, yes, some difficulty, yes, a lot of difficulty, or no, can't do at all. So there are just four possible responses for each of the questions. Difficulty seeing, <coughs> difficulty hearing, difficulty walking or climbing, steps, difficulty remembering or concentrating, difficulties with self-care, such as washing or dressing. Um, in your usual language, you have difficulty communicating, for example, um, being understood or understanding. And you simply ask the respondent to say, um, no, some difficulty, a lot of difficulty, cannot do at all. That's it. So the word disability isn't even mentioned. So how do you then analyse that data? That is very simple. You can decide how you want to define disability from that data set. So... The standard sort of idea about what that, that you is, is being used in many places, and particularly the Washington Group recommend, is that you would identify a population as being um, disabled as including all those with difficulties in at least one of those areas. We call them domains of functioning. So you have to have a positive response to one of those recorded at a lot of difficulty or can't do at all. So that's what we call the standard cutoff. So that's a lot of difficulty or can't do at all in any one of those six domains. Um, but the fact is that, that disability is a continuum and the really good thing about the Washington Group is that you can decide where the cutoff is going to be depending on what you want to do with the information. So in education terms, for example, I like to favour including some difficulty. So then you're getting much more information about potentially about children and young people who may have some difficulty, which could have some impact on their learning styles, for example. Whereas if you're looking for a more general population um, survey, household survey, whatever, and you think you, know, you can do standard cut-off, a lot of difficulty or can't do at all. Governments that are using this in surveys tend to fancy cannot do at all <laughs> because obviously they're wanting to limit the number of, uh, um, of people with disabilities that are included if they're thinking about things like social protection or the provision of services. So um, either way, what you have is when you, when you actually ask this question and you put it into a survey, is you can then use whatever cutoff you decide, and you can change that at any point in time once you've collected the data. So it's really cool. So in summary, it's designed for quantitative analysis. This is really, really important. This is quantitative. This is population-based. You're getting basically a prevalence rate, nothing more. It cannot do anything more than that. It gives you a general prevalence. But... Um, it should not be used in place of more uh, disability surveys if you want to do something specifically around provision of services. You need to understand much more about the... the, the um, you need to be more accurate, but also you need to understand much more about barriers. Um, so that will require additional information, probably from the qualitative side of things, where you then 
perhaps go back to a population that have um, been identified as potentially having a disability, according to the Washington group. So you follow up populations that have said cannot do at all or have a lot of difficulty, and you can follow those populations up with more qualitative measures um, if you're wanting to, to plan more specifically. Um, and then you build um, into data disaggregation. So basically, you are able to get a, a slightly more nuanced, five minutes left, a slightly more nuanced um, understanding of the population that you're working with. So, um, okay, it, uh, because I've only got five minutes left, I think um, one of the things that struck me about how useful this, um, this is, is when we looked at... Um, general household survey data from South Africa, we were doing a social protection review, big um, program uh, study around um, disabled people's experiences of social protection. And so we were in South Africa and we had data from South Africa um, about um, access to um, their social grant. So we were looking at how many disabled people um, with different impairments were able to access the social grant. Social grant has quite a, a positive, generally speaking, it's, it's a good grant um, from social protection point of view. But when we actually crunched the numbers, so we were able to take the Washington Group uh, questions, which had been used in the general household survey, and we applied it to the information um, produced in the, um, from social protection. What we found was very interesting. Because when we broke down into the six domains, what we found um, is that um, as you go from no difficulty through to cannot do at all, we were kind of expecting that we would see more targeted um, inclusion of people that have more severe difficulties because that's what the Social Protection Programme claimed to be doing, to be reaching those who have the most difficulties, who are the most socially excluded. What we actually found is that, yes, there was a continuum. So as you go up to the point of a lot of difficulty, generally speaking, the more uh, there are more people who have um, a lot of difficulty compared to no difficulty. But when it came to cannot do at all, we suddenly <coughs> saw a drop-off. So there are fewer people, in effect, who are being targeted by the social protection program who, who have very severe impairments. So we were able to take this information back to the government and say there, there could be some... We don't know what this means, why this is happening, but something about the setup, something about the way the program is being delivered is somehow disadvantaging people who have the most severe impairments. And that became particularly in areas of uh, communication um, and remembering were two areas where this was, was particularly um, big. So by disaggregating at this level, we were able to then go back to the government and say, you know, this, this is fine. Generally speaking, it's working. You're getting, you know, reasonable levels of inclusion. Um, but there does seem to be a problem with the administration, the way it's being implemented. So I don't have time to talk about anything else, but um, I think basically, in summary, there are two things. One, we need to push for much more data disaggregation around disability, and everything should be disaggregated by disability in the same way that we are managing to get that for gender. It is really, really important. The second thing is, I think we need to be making good use of these formalized Washington Group questions because they really, really work, and they are, they are starting to have an impact on the way um, regular mainstream programs think about the inclusion of disabled people. Sorry for getting this. Okay, thank you very much, Lorraine. That was a very nice, clear explanation of something that's very important. The Washington Group questions are really revolutionizing, even for those of us who don't really do numbers, like me, I can hardly count to 10. <laughs> I'm a qualitative person. But it's really important for us to know more about how many people there are and what kind of difficulties they have. And um, so that can be linked directly to services and to other types of interventions. So, and now for something completely different, let's move on to Maria. Um, you're, you're there, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, let me just. Can you still connect it? Can you? Yeah. Uh, I'm just testing the microphone. Yeah, is that clear? Oh, where's my Okay, so just while we're waiting, um, I work. Someone glasses off. I um, work very part time at the International Centre for Evidence and Disability at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, I'm a qualitative researcher, uh, lots of participatory stuff is what I like. Um, I'm going to uh, um, brainstorm from the big picture, I'm going to go down to the small picture. Um, I'm going to talk about Ghana. To be honest, I think I could be talking about any country in Sub Saharan Africa. And I think I could probably be talking about, I've worked in South America and Southeast Asia. And I could also be talking about there as well, with some exceptions, I think, around uh, some issues to do with family breakup, which I think do change a bit. But I'm going to talk about a mixed method study, but I'm going to focus on the quality quality of the I'm going to drop in a few bits of quads. Um, I, uh, I'm going to cherry pick, because I've only got 20 minutes, so I'm going to brush over a lot of stuff and cherry pick. Building up of trust and everything else, and 
when they tell you everything's fine and you know it's not fine and they finally tell you by the second or third visit what the reality of their life is. Um, I, I just think it, I, I know it can be expensive, but it's a massive, it's so important. Um, so in total we had 38 interview sets. Um, that's not perfectly three times 18. We had some children die early on and then we were selecting new families as we went along. Worked across five languages, um, a mixture of purposeful and theoretical sampling. Um, and we also we tried to interview the caregiver at home and where possible on their own rather than in the, in the support group setting. And where we could do a secondary interview, a, another short interview with a secondary caregiver identified by the caregiver, we tried to do that. Uh, a few, I'm just going to pick out, I'm cherry picking, there's so much information um, here. Uh, but on our study population, so I was planning to do loads of participatory stuff with children, and our mean age was 3.8 years, so I realised that I wasn't going to be doing much participatory stuff with our children. Uh, we had a roughly a good gender balance, 47% were female. I think it's interesting to put up the level of severity of cerebral palsy, because, you know, 50% were mild and moderate. And when I looked at the qualitative work and the impact, sometimes the impact was as great sometimes on people with very mild forms of cerebral palsy. And I think they are easy fruits that we can be easily making change with. Whereas sometimes some of the really severe complex disabilities is very difficult. There was still change, but I just put that up there. You won't be surprised to know that 95% were female. In fact, that should be 96%. Uh, mothers or grandmothers. Um, we were very surprised. Um, that shouldn't stay at home then. Sorry, I was moving slides around with the train coming down. Seventy percent of our children at the start were underweight, stunted, or wasted, and we hadn't realised it was going to be that level. And when you look at the Ghana national data, that's still incredibly high. Um, and within that, forty-five percent of the caregivers reported problems with feeding. And we did a whole separate study then looking at the feeding experiences, which I'm not going to talk about today, but if you are interested in that, then you um, do have a look at that. Um, we had 14, so in our um, qualitative sample, we had 14 mothers, three grandmothers, very low levels of education. Now, I think this is important. 50%, it's actually 51% of households, the father was absent. And I don't think we ask this enough. We're not asking the right question in our survey. So often if you ask people who are married, yes, they're married. I took the Young Lives, the question from the Young Lives survey in Oxfordshire, which asked it in a completely different way, and I asked if the biological father of the child is at home, and then asked how frequently the father visits. And then we had 51% of families' fathers absent. In the qualitative sample, when they really got to know you, 11 out of 18 of those families, the father was absent. In 6 out of 18 cases, the father worked regularly away from home, or it was a polygamous marriage and he was never to be seen again, um, having had a child with a disability. And we had one father in the group who was an active father in caregiving. And by the last um, uh, interview, sadly, he had been imprisoned for something completely unrelated to his child. Um, and, and that was a very sad story. But, you know, that needs to be much more evident. And I don't see it evident enough in our work that these are largely single parent female heavy that does differ if you start going to Southeast Asia and, and stuff like that. So I, I would say this is quite common within the African context. Um, and overall, uh, very low uh, quality of life measures that we use. So if I look at the qualitative work of baseline, um, very high levels of stigma and discrimination and pervasive traditional beliefs. I've worked more than 30 years in international development, but I've not worked in West Africa before. And you know, we interview people who talked about poisoning their children to see if they were really human. Uh, so that level of stigma and discrimination, I don't think we had really seen, or I haven't seen as, as, as high before. High levels of emotional stress and physical exhaustion of caregivers, very limited wider family support, lack of community social safety nets, isolation of the caregiver, a big impact on caregiving on livelihoods, um, and poverty coming in. So these were key issues at the baseline. Uh, this is an example of Matilda, uh, five years old, lived with her grandparents, mother had died, very severely malnourished when we met her. Uh, the, the grandmother said, we thought she was a child, but when she finally came, she was like this. We are the Prafra people, it's a particular ethnic group in the Upper East of Ghana. It's our duty to consult the gods and do traditional treatment of the condition. A lot has been said and we've done a lot, but to no avail. 
And sadly, this is one of the children who died very early on in the study. Um, it was all, I think, within one, one parent group training before the Lord passed away. So I'm throwing this up. I'm a qualitative person. There is very little mortality data on children with disabilities. We work a lot with children. Where do they go? I think you do really well to make it to be an adult with a disability in a low-income setting. We followed up, um, and clever people at the university worked out the standard mortality ratio, which doesn't mean a lot to me. But what I can tell you is that if you are between one and five years old, you are almost 15 times more likely to die than children in the standard population for developing, comparing with developing country data. And if you were between one and 12, we were able to get Ghana population data, and you are almost six times more likely to die within that time period. Now that is shocking, and I think we should know be following more things like that, and we should know that more obviously. Our quality of life did improve at the end with nice orange bars, and as a qualitative person, I wanted to understand why, or our team did. Uh, so improved knowledge. If you've got no knowledge, then having some knowledge is power and confidence. A lovely grandmother who was an amazing member of our group. You know, I first took her to the hospital. The hospital, the doctor just said she was lazy because of her weight. The doctor did not tell me anything, but traditional healers told me it was something called ashram. So the power of having an increase in knowledge made them emotionally happier about the child's condition, far greater acceptance of the child, far greater patience. One of the things they, that, that was came out was that it's, it's, if you're less frustrated and you have some understanding the treatment with the child will be far more patient, improved care. There were lots of examples of improved resilience and improved feelings of self-worth and self-esteem of the caregiver, where there was less self-blame for having given birth to a child with a disability. Um, here is an example here on the left, Rebecca, very malnourished here on the left, but quite ingenious. That's an upturned stool. I thought that was quite clever. Um, but in a corner, a dark corner of the house. And then by the end of the study, this is the same child in a paper mache. If you're used to paper technology, appropriate paper technology, um, to have a standing frame, and um, the mum here much happier um, about uh, understanding her child's condition and uh, trying to improve the nutrition for the child. And you'd think that's all wonderful. I, quite, I tend to focus on challenges, I'm afraid. Um, this is her family. She lives with the mother-in-law. The mother-in-law is this rather stern-looking woman on the right. And her, the, the father of the child is working away in Accra. He came over the 14 months he came home once. So she's living with this extended family, and she feels very isolated and rejected within the family. And she doesn't feel that they are supported at all. And that did not change over the course of the project. You know, there was a whole complexity and she didn't have economic control over what decision making within the household if she wanted to improve nutrition for her for her daughter. Um, that wasn't possible. Um, so, you know, the, the complexity of the kinship issues going on, you know, really needed much more looking at within our program. Um, but in terms of the support group, in a way they became the family for many people, if I hear the word, it was like my family, that was almost consistent across every interview, definitely helped in reducing social isolation, um, a lot of psychosocial support, I'm not on my own, very common, a safe place to talk about very difficult situations, a lot of collective sharing, helping to reduce stigma, and a lot of peer learning. These are two grandmothers here, supporting each other about look, looking after the child. Here we go. I realised at first I wasn't doing that, sharing problems, but now I realise we are one family, so that was a big issue. Um, this picture here, uh, this mother here with her son who has got quite a severe level of disability, she was not able to put him down. He would constantly cry, and her main income was through hat weaving. So you can imagine how much hat weaving went on. Her mother, there on the right, has, um, I can never pronounce it, elephantiasis. So <coughs> very disabled, not in receipt <coughs> of any uh, social protection because they weren't uh, of the right political allegiance at the local community level. So they didn't get onto the LEAP program, which is an important livelihood program, despite the fact that they had two people with disability within the family. Um, so we want to talk about caregiver empowerment and empower, you know, power over local social 
political processes, how realistic is that? So that didn't change over the course of the programme, although other aspects of quality of life did improve. So um, we, we, when we talk about inclusion with livelihoods, we talk about the inclusion of people with disability. I have yet very rarely to hear about how you address caregivers of children with disabilities within livelihoods programmes. I don't hear it, and if you do hear it, I'll, I'll certainly be interested to hear about that. Um, so I think you know we need to look at the gendered nature, nature of caregiving and interaction with poverty if we are really going to make a difference to the lives of children with disabilities. And so we're about to hopefully put out a paper uh, that's going to a journal that we hope to be far too long, looking at the empowerment journey. So we've gone back into the data to look at dis different aspects of empowerment for those caregivers. Um, and I love all the IDS stuff, so there's a lot of material from IDS that has gone into that paper. Um, so if you look at the new global strategy on women, children, and adolescent health, what does it say? We want a transformative approach, and we want women and children to be powerful agents for improving their own health. And in these CPR, WHO uh, guidelines, we talk about the importance of empowering people and their families um, to ensure everyone has access to a right. And then we've got the social model of disability, which focuses on adults with disabilities. No one, I really feel, and, and I'm looking for people to challenge at the end, you know, I don't think caregivers are really part of the disability discourse, or they're not enough in that disability discourse when we're talking about children. But I'm really happy to be challenged on that. Um, that's a lot. So take home messages. Um, I really didn't know who was coming tonight, and I thought, oh, my teacher people to stock eggs, so I picked out a few. Mm -hmm. uh, longitudinal research, you'll probably love lots of your qualitative research, and do we do enough of it, can we get funding enough for it, that's always a challenge, but it makes such rich data. We've already talked about the danger of homogenising people with disability, and that's the same for children with disability. And if you're talking about children with cerebral palsy and multiple impairments, you, you've got to look at that separately, or not separately, got to be able to look at the varying challenges. I think we've got to look much more at the intersectionality of the gendered nature of caregiving, disability, stigma and poverty. We are doing those children a disservice. And um, it's only because I'm about to publish this paper on empowerment, I said to a treat, if we really want to be transformative, then we've also got to understand caregiver empowerment and what does that mean in practice. On my last slide, at the programming level, so less of a research level, um, yes, caregiver support groups can be effective perhaps in the short term, but they've got to be part of something much bigger. We've got to, we very much looked at the demand side, and there was very little going on in the communities about affecting what I call the supply side. So we, we were empowering these caregivers to then take their child to the nutrition service, for example, and the nutrition people were turning them along and saying, we don't, we don't work with children like this. So, you know, we've, we've got to be working with them. Um, we've got to look more at the specific needs of caregivers and also looking at their mental health needs, child protection, safeguarding, um, looking at earlier detection and earlier intervention. You know, I met my cleverest young boy, 12 years old, he had only started going to school at 11 and he was already had contractures so he would never be able to hold a pen and he can't feed himself and, you know, early intervention would have addressed that. So a much bigger focus on early intervention um, and looking at disability related stigma within the family as well. I mean, I know there's a lot of national level stuff, which is great, but getting it down to the family and the community. And I think that's what we're looking at. Oh, that's some of the articles. And we have put everything on a new hub called UbuntuHub.org. So all our materials and our Great. Urgent questions yes, I meant to say we could have a couple of. Well, let's have a clap first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if you got a clap, did you? Or did you? Um, so, just uh, let's have. Uh, are there any clarification questions, just quick ones, for either Lorraine or uh, Maria before we carry on? And then we'll have more of a panel discussion at the end. But anything from those two? Presentations, yeah.
Sorry, could you just ask yeah. again because it's on sure. the recording? I was just asking with the um, Washington group questions, if they have questions that are written in a easy to read language, if you were speaking with young people or children. Um, so the question is whether um, there are Washington group questions that are suitable for children to respond. So it's not a question about... So you might have to say okay. a bit more. Okay. Uh, okay. There are, there, are, um, there are different translations available of the short set that you saw there in different languages. Um, for children, we have um, the... What you didn't... Um, see is um, we have used the short set of questions with uh, young people as as they're written um, without changing any of the language at all um, except for translation for, I think the youngest were about 11 or 12 um, up to sort of 17, 18 and that works quite well I mean it works has worked fine in terms of um, children who are younger what is what tends to happen is um, that uh, it's used through a proxy. So it would be um, a parent or a caregiver would answer on behalf of the child. Mm -hmm. There are um, specific questions which are designed for children who are actually below the age of 18, mm -hmm. but we have been testing below the age of 12. So there is a, there is a specific um, set of questions just for children because some of those questions for children identifying impairments or difficulties in children is more difficult. Mm -hmm. So there is, a, there is a slightly different question set, um, but they are designed to be asked of parents or caregivers. You can go to the website. There, if you just Google in Washington group questions, there is a, there is a, a website. It's interactive. You can post questions. Um, I think this is a good point. If you if you want to um, raise the question with the Washington Group about you know whether there'll be any work on on questions which are directly relevant to, to particularly younger children, um, post the question and see what they say. Great, thank you. Just to add to that, I have done a little bit of work on developing a picture-based version of the. Yeah, thanks. Marie, I just had a question about the death rates for children with cerebral palsy, which yeah. are pretty shocking um, yeah. compared to the regular population. Did your research say anything more about the reasons for that? Is it lack of care? Is it uh, complications? So that's, ooh, that's a bit loud, isn't it? That's a really good question. Um, and funnily enough, you, we weren't even going to look at that data. And then someone very clever said, oh, no, I want to do something clever with that. Um, we did get everybody to report or found families because what happens when the child died they didn't come back to the support group so we then had to do quite a lot of work to go and find them in the communities um, I think seven out of the eight it was all said to do with malnutrition um, from our qualitative studies um, I think three were part of our sample originally and of the two that I had done interviews with uh, a local interviewer, uh, definitely neglect, uh, malnutrition, but s tied up with severe neglect and traditional beliefs. And we identified the families in the April. The project started in the July. Um, and even though there were referrals for um, malnutrition, um, severe malnutrition, it was, you know, there were lots of complications with that. Um, but I would certainly urge we do need to be monitoring that data more because when I've discussed it with other people, uh, other therapists, they'll often say, oh, yeah, no, we've seen these children in our, in our clinics or in our groups, and then we don't ever see them again. And I just think we need to be looking at that a bit more. I think we I think there was another population group that was dying at a 10 times higher rate than 
the regular population group, yeah. there, that would be pretty shocking, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. I think we also know, am I, am I good? Yeah. Um, we also know that children with cerebral palsy are more prone to infection. Yeah. And so, but we also know that quite often the caregivers don't seek help as quickly as they mm -hmm. would with their other children. So, you know, if the child is getting sick quite often, they know it's going to be costly to go. So they've got a child who's more sickly, but they take them less often. Yeah. So that happens, I don't know about Ghana, but generally in lots of African yeah. countries that's the case. So they sometimes value that child less or they think this child is rather expensive, so we'll keep him at home and we'll see what happens. Yeah. And so that sort of thing is, it's not deliberate neglect, but it's a concern about the cost and it's a sickly child. So. I mean, what I would say, and I'm a, a qualitative person, the children in our groups were... Um, on average 3.8 years we didn't have anybody under 18 months and I think that those children with very severe cerebral palsy wouldn't have even made it to the groups because in this country we'd have people with gastro tubes you know you don't get things like that in somewhere like Ghana so you know I, it would be interesting I would expect it to possibly even be higher actually Hello, can you hear this? Oh, really? No. Oh. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah. Is that? Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Um, I'll try to make sure I pitch my voice and. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. And if it goes quiet, just. Um, yeah. Or throw something at me. <laughs> so. Um, okay. That's fine. Um, bear with me one second. I'm just going to get the screen up on, on for me as well. Bear with me a second, and I will just do this. Okay, so um, thank you for asking me to come and speak here today. I'm going to hopefully take you on a bit of a journey from... Sorry, come, come and sit, get settled in. That's all right. Uh, hopefully just take you on a bit of a quick journey from the work that we do in Brighton, uh, which spreads out across the country, and I'll illustrate what that work is. Uh, and I hope that we take that discussion further into the work that we're now being asked to do internationally with the Commonwealth of Learning and why that matters. 
Um, okay, so in the first instance, I'll just tell, us, tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, I'm from Diversity and Ability. Uh, I'm one of the founders of it. There's a network of 105 of us now across the country, but where our office is based in Brighton, and we're a social enterprise designed uh, and completely built by disabled lived experiences. And what we do is focus on assistive technology to make sure we support it and train it very well in people's homes. We work largely with universities, so Cambridge, Imperial, and Oxford are probably our most famous clients. Hopefully soon Sussex as well, by the looks of things. But what we do is provide assistive technology training, essentially assistive technology training in people's houses, in their homes, of students. That's, the, that's essentially the story. We started, oh, we started 15 years ago. Um, I needed support, couldn't really get it. It's a big discussion, but mostly for me, what I needed was familiarity. And I didn't find it easy. Um, I came from a space where class was an issue, culture was a difference, and I very rarely could see what most academics talk about, social capital, that sense of familiarity that says, you're entitled to this, you should expect this, you can access this, and we're here to give you this. Um, I was very locked out of those kind of environments and the thinking that that would even be there. So most of my childhood and academic understanding came much later on in life, but even then, it was really about masking what I thought I hope people didn't find out about, rather than being excited about the way I did anything. Um, I, went, I, I just, in a snapshot, I found my voice strangely in Palestine. I set up a fair trade olive oil company, which some of you might have come across, called Zaytun. Uh, it became really popular, um, and I really sort of found my voice doing that. And it made me think a lot about what I needed when I was younger. And mostly it was an organization that really talked about talent and strength and assets and learning differences and, and, and that diversity of thought. Um, I suspect we were really successful largely in Palestine because of the way I saw the world rather than despite it. Anyhow, in relation to this work, so what I wanted to do was try and figure out is how could I get more people to reach people like me at a younger age? And what difference would that make? Rather than, we live in a country that provides a DSA. Some of you have accessed it and seen it. Some of you know the Disabled Students Allowance. It's a great system. It's a great system. It's, but it's essentially, and the access to work. Anyone heard of access to work? Yeah? Grants and funding to support disabled people in the workplace. So we're really, we're in a country, it's one of the most progressive countries in the world on providing assistive technology for people. But if they are only at higher education, if they are in gainful employment, you can see the problem, right? It's huge, right? It's a huge problem. So we were really interested in saying, right, well, how do we create a story? What we focused on was building a social enterprise that would look at lived experiences of marginalized people and whether their teaching and their way of navigating systems was an asset and whether that would lead to more disabled students engaging in the DSA. Would it allow more students to talk about the support? Would it allow more students to talk about sharing strategies? That really grew and grew and grew. So we built a big network around that. So, but then we were still stuck with the same feeling and the same stress to say, well, what about the folks that don't get here? And, and what, how do we, we can't just pretend that's not happening. So our focus has been for quite a few years, and I'm going to talk about why we went internationally in a different way for a moment. But our focus has been really largely combat, combating homelessness. Um, I'm strongly saying outright that a huge population of homeless people are going to be neurodivergent. But they are not going to be assessed for that. It's a class-based discussion for people to find out. Do they have autism? Do they have dyslexia? Do they have... The people that do find out when they're not from a, a, a more... I'm, I know I'm generalizing, but, but when we look at it in the cases of people from really lower working class environments that know about it beforehand, they know about it because there's been pupil referral units involved. There's been custodial sentences involved. Most folks who get to know when they're young are coming from a comfortable European, often white, middle class setting. That doesn't make it any easier, but it does allow the anticipatory support to kick in. It means the anticipatory support, the Equalities Act, is accessible to you. If you don't have that anticipatory way of working, then you're locked out of it. 
The ramifications that are on that are huge. So uh, the combat, really, I, I'm going to say this really quickly because I want to get to where I want to, is that we're living in a digital by default world. It is really one that says you've got to go online if you want to access a university application. You've got to go online if you want to access just basic welfare. Whether you can read is not the question. It's just you have to just go online. That digital by default narrative <laughs> creates an underclass. It creates an underclass of people who are locked out of that through socioeconomics, and it creates an underclass of people who just don't navigate the world through that uh, paradigm, really. This is the government's digital, well, it's a policy paper on 2020 to get everyone online by 2020. Do you think, folks, we're on that target for that? <laughs> we're not, right? We're not. It's huge. I, I'm not going to spend ages on this, but we're just not. That's a biggie. If you can think about universal application, sorry, universal credit applications, the amount of people disabled that have got to prove how many job searches they've done, upload it onto a website in order to access their welfare. The question of whether they can access a home computer is not on the table. The question of whether they can fill out the form is not on the table. The question, what is on the table is how much of a journal have they completed and what can they justify and prove? It is a, a real life issue that, again, I don't want to be too emotive, but the, I'm ra raising this issue with DWP at a national level. The, the folks in Brighton, they're good folks, essentially. They don't, I'd have never met anyone DWP in Brighton that's part of a hostile environment or wants to reinforce that. What I do see is people who say, we don't know what to do about this. Um, what I also tell you this is that the people that really need that support around autism and dyslexia, for example, that don't know that instead are feeling a sense of helplessness and a sense of lack of belonging or a sense that they just don't deserve much. They take that problem elsewhere. They take it to physical mental health manifestations. They take it to accident emergencies in some cases, you know, in some cases. But no, more normally, they're taking it to local libraries. Yeah? So the DWP isn't really seeing it. So it's not doing anything anticipatory about it. Uh, and if you ask them, they'll say, well, if someone tells us they need help, that they've got a statement, then we'll do something. You can see the problem, right? It's a, it's a circle. Why does that matter? Because really, the theme isn't to talk about people with disabilities. It's to talk about what is disabling. What is a disabling situation? We are all going to face disabling situations the moment we're elderly, right? We have this real narrative to other people. I, I think it's not helpful. We do need to talk about a social model far more than we do, rather than it just be an add-on in the way we contextualize what we do in, in this. Um, but again, I, I don't want to break the room. I'm just saying it's, a, it's an issue that I think people seem to not really understand what it means. So I, I'd like to talk about that more. So um, I'm just going to fast forward it. But this is the reality on the streets, really. Um, I'm not going to really hide why this is happening, but it's a choice. And it has happened. And it's real. These are stats that are really happening, and these are stats that are actually pulled from the UK Parliament. I mean, you know, make it that way you will. Um, the gap is getting worse. We are seeing more and more. Uh, so there's a real, we are seeing more and more homeless folks c coming onto the streets. We're seeing more rough sleepers, but we're also seeing a lot more people sofa sleeping, and we're seeing a lot more people dealing with the shame and the fear of that. But what we're not seeing is a lot more people accessing the conversations that they need to around hidden learning differences and how disabling they can be. What we're also not seeing is the idea that this technology, and this is where I'm getting to, is makes such a life-changing difference, and it can be free. DNA's focus, my focus is to look at open source free technology. Yes, I want it to be free, because the most disabling thing on Earth, I think, is attitudes. It's the ones we have about ourselves, but it's the ones we have about people we've never met. But couple that with social economics, and you have a problem that's far bigger than just talking about whether ramps are there and whether diagnosis is available. Those two things, social economics and attitudes, is, is the most disabling thing on earth. And we've got to try and get understand what that actually means. Um, this is an example. I mean, it's a vicious circle, but uh, some, some of you, I'm sure, I'm sure you've, this is old hat to you, trauma-informed care. People would have worked on that, right? I would have thought, yeah? Um, so... Oh, yeah, sure. I haven't even heard. 
it's okay, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. No, it's okay, so I didn't, I, no, fine, Actually, yeah, I, I didn't even hear them. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so um, I'm really just going to touch on this, I'm really conscious of time, learning isolation. It, it, oh, yeah, sure, okay, sorry. So this is about the realities, social economics, learning isolation, literacy, illiteracy, addiction, mental health, homelessness, they are all interconnected. The biggie being learning isolation. I deliberately use that term. I don't know if it's a common term. It's just a term that I choose to use because it's isolating. And when you don't have a diagnosis and you find out late in life, it has a ramification. It can be incredibly cathartic to think, wow, that explains it. Uh, I had to go to perhaps the most famous political conflict in the world to find out how I learn. Right? And that was good. I was really grateful for that experience. But it was, um, I was lucky to understand that I could do something and then work out, uh, finally, at, at the age of 32, to get a diagnosis to understand. Okay, that explains a lot. Um, but for most folks, it's a lot harder than that. The social economics is much there. And it's compelling. So learning isolation, I'd like to talk about, because if we talk about that, then we can start talking about what is a disabling situation, rather than whether someone has a protected characteristic that they can identify with or prove. Um, um, this is just me, really. I'm just saying it, really, that we are in a digital in the age of ever increasing digital dependency. The future of illiteracy will be based on one thing, and it will be those who can communicate via the internet and those who can't. All right. So I thought I'd fast forward it slightly because the technology is there. We live in a space where open source technology is available. I champion it a lot. Our entire team does. We are really excited by open source technology for two reasons. One, because it, it can deal with the socioeconomic gaps. Not on its own, but it's part of it, because it's free. But more importantly than that, it can be driven by lived experiences. It's driven by communities that are marginalized themselves. What that does in terms of employment opportunities and aspiration setting is huge. It can change a lot of things. We have a, we've supported 17,000 people as an organization. From, from, from where we started, we, we, as I said, we fund our work with street homelessness through charging Cambridge and Imperial and Oxford for what we do, and they're happy to pay it. Um, but it allows us to change the gaps of, for people who can't access funding at all, and it allows us to change the gaps for people who wouldn't access the assistive technology they're normally awarded by looking at open source technology. Um, this took me to working with the Commonwealth for Learning, um, I don't know how many of you have known this. I've just come back from Mauritius, so I'm a bit dis disorientated, but I'll tell you why. Um, because you, Mauritius has made free education, higher education, free for everybody. I've, I've worked quite with the, um, with the University of Mauritius recently, just literally last week, but along with the idea of what that means to, to, for in terms of its United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, it's huge. In terms of tackling poverty, education, the right to equality, it's huge. The answer they had, and this has been a project that I've been working for the last you know, eight months, was they didn't really have an answer for disabled people. Um, whilst they've ratified the UNCRPD accords, sorry, these accords here, they didn't have an answer for it. Real shame, huh? A real tough shame to come that close and not do that. So we've built a program with Mauritius on how they can utilize open source technology and create jobs. What the, 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 the role model for it isn't, is not UK higher education, it's not. What I'm using to role model that is the work that we're doing in Crisis and St Mungo's. And, and I guess that's the theme of what I'm saying, thinking locally and acting globally. I'm using the software and the technologies and the approaches that we have done for people on the streets here and applying that to people disconnected through poverty and disablement. Um, so... Um, I'm sure you know you know what these are, so I won't bore you with that. Uh, that's the United Nations Sustainable, it's the 17 goals. And my point is that maybe Mauritius can be one of the first folks to, to, to try and tackle that. Um, this is the team. Uh, this was only taken last week. I'm really grateful that we're able to build, so we're not trying to build a global diversity and ability brand. I'm trying to not exist, really. Um, but we have built a team of folks who are going to take on and that we're building virtual learning environments for them to do assessments of needs for people and to train. That's the team itself uh, that are now doing that. Uh, it's the University of Mauritius as well as uh, the Global Rainbow Foundation there. Um, again, it's really amplified by socioeconomic poverty 
and it's amplified by lived experiences and it's amplified by marginalization, but it's also amplified by incredible, incredible deep connections of what this technology can do with people when it's supported well. Um, I'm just going to summarize, just, I'm coming at the end, really. These are just examples. Google Keep, it's free. It's not open source, but I like it. It's free. It's really helpful. Uh, seeing AI, I have that on my phone, and I can show you afterwards. We created a virtual learning environment. You, there's a link to it there, and if I can show you, I will do. But this is seeing AI. Has anyone ever come across that, or be my eyes? Yeah? See, seeing AI. Be my eyes. Great. How are you finding it? Oh, you never go. Okay, it's quite interesting. There are, do you know how many blind people there are in the world? Uh, roughly, just roughly. Three? 253 million. Yeah, 253 uh, million. Mi 45 million people with virtual visual impairment need. 45 million. It's huge. 45 million, right? We don't have enough people you sign up to Be My Eyes. It's not because it's so popular. It's because, again, it's a social economics. What Be My Eyes does, I'll say really quickly, anyone can help. I really recommend you all signing up to it. It means that a blind person may, I supported someone in San Francisco who couldn't find their keys, and they just sign on. I can see their phone, and their phone links to mine, and I can see their home, and I'm saying, look, if you move your hand just to a little bit there, there it is, and, 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 you know, and he had it, and it was great, and that was it. And our time zones worked really well. Um, so it's a way of helping each other connect. But there are an awful lot of people signed on to it and saying, well, I'm not being getting to use because there are not enough blind folks using it. But it's actually, it's just about socioeconomics who can get the smartphone technology in the first place, right? Um, I'll, I'll really talk about that in a moment. But this is Priscilla. She was using it. Um, I spelled foundation wrong. Right <laughs> um, so what I really liked is we gave her Be My Eye. She's now teaching this. She teaches Braille. She's a school teacher. And she teaches Braille. She uses dominoes to do it, you know, to start off with kids. That was great watching that. Um, and we, she has a smartphone, so we put Seeing AI. I have it on my phone. I can show you afterwards. But it will allow her to just take a picture. And so if she was looking at, you know, she was just looking at you or just looking at Mary, she'd be able to see that's a, that's a black top. She could see that's a striped top. What I really liked about it is she said, I can choose my clothes. You know, I that was really simple. I can choose my own clothes. Whatever... Be my seeing AI does, you point to a piece of paper and it will just immediately read to you. If she was here online, she'd be able to take a picture of this room and it will say there are tables, there are how many people. If she points here, she can say there are three people in front of you. you know, it just tells, and she, it's completely free. Uh, it's built by, again, lived experiences. Be my eyes, it's just the sheer solidarity of being blind from birth, but being able to link with other people around the world. But m my main thing is that Priscilla is a teacher and she's able to teach this technology to other kids that she's working with. Um, that's it, really. I did that as quickly as I could. Um, and I guess the thing I want to really... I say this maybe as... This is about social economics. I, I say this as a, as a Bangladeshi kid growing up in England. I don't know what I'm really saying, other than wh whatever we actually get into this, how we do this, the benevolence of this, or the connection it has, it's got to be really authentic, and that means tackling class in such a profound way. We don't actually, I don't often find as a Bangladeshi that I meet other Bangladeshis from poorer communities in the UK saying, I want to work on international development. Because it's often done for us, you know, and, and just like the disability movement, nothing about us without us, you know. It's trying to work out how do we meet, meet those bridges. Those lived experiences are really real. My role modeling for this wasn't international development. It wasn't, although that's what I studied it. So it was working with what we've managed to achieve on street homelessness and bring that to Mauritius rather than bringing universities in the UK to Mauritius. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. yeah? All right, okay, that's it really. Great, thank you very much. Very interesting. So one or two questions for Atif while John gets ready. Um, so Anybody want to ask Atif anything? I mean, I'll leave leaflets for DNA as well, because you guys will be interested in that. Thank you very much. Um, my, my question about, is about the DSA, because I'm a, a PhD student, I'm a British citizen, um, but they changed the policies in 2017 so that you have to be able to live in the country for 20 years, um, or 
before you can access student finance and student finance is linked to DSA. Um, I've been trying to ask this for so many people and no one will give me a straight answer because I do know that EU citizens will be subject to the same laws as normal citizens. So does, does that mean that next year all the, people, all the EU citizens who have disability support with DSA that haven't lived here for 20 years are going to lose it? Sorry, just saying, I actually don't know the answer to that. I think that's terrible. Absolutely terrible. I've not heard that. Um, I will say, on our website, we have a list of free software to replicate what they're giving out on the DSA. Um, we don't sell any software. I just want to make the strategies as accessible to everyone as possible. So I'll give you a link to that. that will say, it'll have text-to-speech software that's free, voice input software that's free, mind mapping that's free, and all those things. I'm not trying to undermine the DSA, I'm just saying, let's get it out there. Thank but I have not heard that, and I just think, again, that's an antithesis of what the DSA should be about, yeah. accessibility for more. Right? There's lots of us that fall through the cracks, but you know, until there's huge numbers, nobody's going to care. Yeah. You know? yeah. Say that into the microphone. Thank you, Atif, for your presentation. Um, it, when we talk about technology coming from Nigeria, uh, one of the things that comes to mind for me is usually how very accessible and affordable can it be for, for people? Um, because I had be, be my eyes on my phone in Nigeria, but I definitely wasn't using it as much as I'm using it now that I am here in the UK. Of course, because of accessibility to the internet and data and all that stuff. And, you have to maybe have an Android phone or an iOS device, which people, people with disabilities who are like less economically disadvantaged may not be able to afford it. So how do we um, kind of make um, technology like this, lived experiences and all these accessibilities that we have, how do we ensure that people that are really marginalized economically can also be able to have access to them and utilize them? even in the aspect of jobs as well. Um, great, yeah, I mean, it's a really powerful question. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the fact that they, I mean, Be My Eyes should sit on every phone. Uh, it should be cross-platform, really. Uh, seeing AI is not in every country yet. It's as a, it has a blind currency converter, which is great, but it, for that reason, it's not in every country because it's still going through that process of it. But what you're really talking about is the sophistication of the phone itself, or even having access to a phone, which is really, and that's, I guess that's a tough, that's a tough, that's a tough question that everyone in development has to work through, is that we work on, uh, this whole room will work on supporting the poor, but the absolute poor are always left out of the paradigm. It's always left out of the, the culture setting. We just don't say it enough, right? And that's, that's the whole belief in trickle down that is so deeply absurd that it's, that it's working and it, it, it isn't. Best we can do is just keep familiarizing technology and talking about things work through lived experiences. So at least there's some authenticity to say, well, it's worked for you. It's not about whether someone from a wealthy background has a fancy gadget that I can't access, but it's more, it's worked for you and that may have a role for me. It's that invitation. But you're right. I, 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 don't, I'm, I wish I could tell you that here it is. The best I can do is keep giving it out for free and have uh, people talking about it and have universities showing it off as a story and a social enterprise. Um, and that's what we're kind of doing. I hope that if, uh, half answers part of your question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Atif. And we might come back to that conversation uh, when we've had John's talk. So thank you. So now our final speaker. So John has come hot foot from teaching students, rushed over here um, to join in. So John is a, a PhD student at the University of Sussex, just over the way. And he's doing a very interesting PhD. So he's going to tell us about that, uh, telling us through sign language, but with his interpreter to voice it for those of us who don't know sign language. Okay, over to you. Uh, with that one. Uh, communication checking, can you hear me okay? Oh, I think you might need to hold that one as well. Yep, yeah, fair enough. Absolutely, is it better? It's okay. Fair enough, <laughs> I've got two now. It's okay. It's Colin who needs the loop. It's okay, yep. Yeah. Colin, can, 
What's your name? It's Marco. Yeah. So Marco, uh, Colin, can you hear Marco? Colin, can you hear me, Marco, the sign language interpreter voice? I can, thank you. Lovely, no problem, brilliant. Actually, I might come close to you so I can see John. I've been warned that there are some uh, noises coming from uh, the, uh, I, I'm not sure if in, I'm in the right position, so I'm sure you will let me know if I make those noises, okay? <laughs> So, yeah, I know that strange sounds haunts me, so let's hope, let's hope that this is not the case. I'm okay in this place? Okay, good. So, um, as I've been introduced, I am a PhD student in the School of Global Studies, and I have been uh, working now almost six years on this PhD, so it's, I'm coming to a conclusion now. <laughs> to the submission of my thesis. So uh, the uh, studies focus on uh, human geography, and I'm focusing on the deaf community specifically. And, um, and more specifically is about Brighton, uh, Brighton and Hove deaf community. But uh, through my studies, I found out that there is more to that. So it's not just the Brighton and Hove deaf community, but this could be permutating something that is wider than that. So I thought that it would have been a good idea to bring some statistics and to show some of my findings as well to what has happened in this through this research with the deaf community. Uh, so we are talking about deaf community as those deaf people that use the sign language. But that includes deaf, hard of hearing, deafened people and hearing people. They are all sign language users as part of the deaf community. So it's not just profoundly deaf or... So they are all type of deafness and including deaf children of hearing, deaf parents, etc. So this was an epistemological investigation trying to find information uh, and uh, noticing actions and behaviours and then extrapolating and theorising based on those results that I have encountered. <clears throat> So generically, I was looking at the context, at the geographical notion of the self, the body, and how these interacted in the various landscapes in which deaf people found themselves in. So the core question of my studies what, was, what is the deaf community? Because that's what, that's what we tend to get asked by lots of people, you talk about deaf community, but what is it, the deaf community? So, I, in this case, I wanted to look at the data of what people say they do and what they do in reality compared to gathering the narrative of what they think they do. So I was trying to come away from the narratives and actually observing the actions, the performativity of the deaf community. I'm not saying by these that the narrative is not important. I'm saying that in my case, in my research, I wanted to focus on the actions and the performance of the individuals as member of the deaf community. So obviously there is a slide now on screen with lots of information about Brighton and Hove. However, what I wanted to say briefly about Brighton and Hove is that it's a city with slightly different environment compared to other cities in the United Kingdom, with slightly different cultures compared to a, the a cities in uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, political activism that is different sometimes compared to the cities in the rest of the United Kingdom, and is a cities that have between 200 and 800 deaf sign language users that live in it. 
and, and also historically uh, is a place where they had three different uh, deaf schools. The, initially, the first one was called the uh, Institute for the Deaf and Dumb, as the term existed in those days. Uh, then later on, uh, Ovingdin Hall School in Ovingdin, uh, which was an oral um, um, schools, a school that used the oral method of education. And the last one is Hamilton Lodge School, which was established in 1947 and is the only one still existing and operating in Brighton and Hove nowadays. Now, luckily in 2011, the census uh, data uh, gave the opportunity to record how many sign language users existed in the United Kingdom. So it was the opportunity for people to uh, write and record if they were using a language different from English, if they wanted to, or if they can, or if they realized that that's what they could have done. Now, that's why uh, we found that the 200 and 800 is a huge gap. That's why we don't know exactly how many deaf people there are, because the question in England was not as sharp as it was in Scotland. So Scotland has better results, more accurate results in their census than United, they, England did. So the general uh, population of sign language user in the United Kingdom is between 22,000 and 151,000. So there is a huge gap based in the two censuses in Scotland and in, in England. So we don't trust the census at the moment, okay? So that's the, the point. However, what was interesting was that uh, out of the census results, a map was created. Now, what this map shows is there are lots of dispersed red dots around Brighton and Hove, which is with an average of 0 0.4 incidence of inhabitation in any one space, which is not indicative of anything if not that deaf people are dispersed throughout the city. Okay, so there is not huge conglomeration of one area. With the exception, of this point where in this area there is a larger uh, red dot which indicates there is a 14% inhabitant in that area. And that is where Hamilton Lodge School is based. Okay, so it's not just because there are deaf children but because there is lots of teachers that live nearby, etc., member of staff, etc. <clears throat> So exactly, so not only the, the children, but we've got the staff, the uh, teachers that have conglomerated, so they come closer in that <coughs> area. And that's why there is this awkward incidence of 14% of inhabitants that use a sign language. Now to talk about the method that I use to conduct the research, uh, so I wanted to the community to uh, take picture of what they thought was deaf community for them. So what was representative uh, for the deaf community? So we gathered these pictures and then we have selected what we would like to call them a group of people that could be the cultural crown of the deaf community. So people that are knowledgeable, that tend to be more on the leading side within the deaf community. So people that had a role to some extent. And they were uh, choosing amongst the uh, total of pictures that they had only 20 photographs that were representative of the deaf community and the culture of deaf people in the area on their, in their opinion, based on their opinion. And that's what they did. Then we went back to the deaf, I went back to the deaf community with a survey which included those pictures and other website uh, links to services for deaf people. And we wanted to know uh, uh, how, 
through the emotional mapping, what they thought about those pictures, about feelings of happiness and kindness. And we had set up a scale between one to seven about uh, happiness and kindness. So being one being not that happy, not that kind, and seven being very happy and not and very kind. And obviously four was the medium, okay, the middle ground where people were indecisive if they felt looking at the picture made them happy or they felt that it was an action of kindness or something that indicated kindness. So I set up also a series with um, a selected number of deaf people, uh, a series of interview, and I asked them to draw a map and then to go through a series of uh, questions and responding about what certain things meant for them. Anyway, overall, I had 40 uh, people involved in these uh, analyses. And uh, I will focus only on the survey, and therefore the number of people involved in, in responding to the survey were 29. So we had 29 respondent to the survey. And it's quite a large sur survey, so it could take between one hour to two hours to some individuals. So it was quite a large undertaking for the people participating. So altogether, we gather 72 hours of data. And the age range of the respondent was between 35 years old to 85 year, years old. And they were all people living or working in Brighton and Hove. Interestingly enough, amongst the respondent, the uh, larger population was women than men. But actually, the cultural crown, the group that selected the picture, there were more men than women. So, I have now uh, projected a slide of one of the pages of the survey. So this was a uh, BSL march in the street, and uh, we were marching, sign language user, we were marching in Brighton, uh, protesting against the lack of recognition of sign language at the time, because we wanted the government to uh, acknowledge the existence of this language in the land. And what you see in the picture is actually some protesters doing a sit-in, and uh, the, Policemen, which actually knew sign language, so actually it's resolved the problem in the end. Oh, okay. that's what the picture is like. And they had to choose if this picture was giving them a sense of happiness and a sense of kindness. And they, they, they could grade it based on the available stars between one or seven. And that was by clicking in the star, on the stars. So I'm sh now showing a number of pictures that indicates uh, what people found uh, in a congruent way, meaning they all agreed that this picture shows something happy, something kind, and they agreed with the cultural crown. So there was agreement between the cultural crown and the rest of the community. One of the picture uh, is a group of uh, cyclists that did a fundraising cycling session and they raised money for a certain organization and that was interesting because these were deaf people themselves participating fundraising for a deaf organization so it was a mutual beneficial venture so again deaf people agreed in the community that these words a kind gesture are something that indicated something nice kind and make them feel happy. Now, the second picture is a group of people wearing all the same T-shirt as volunteers for a deaf event. And in the photo, actually, there are a mixture between deaf and hearing people. But it's actually, you, you look quite uniform because they're wearing all the same T-shirt with the same volunteering and the title of the event. So it, it's a sense of uniformity. 
the third picture, uh, these are tables uh, in a picture that it was taken at a deaf ball. Again, it was a, a fundraising event. And they're all coming together in memory or celebrating something. So again, it was a sense of community or conviviality. Then there is another picture that is a transformative equality because uh, the local government at Brighton and Hove uh, Council has adopted the BSL Charter. So they are committing themselves to improve services for deaf people <coughs> and sign language users. And they chose a young deaf person from Hamilton Lodge to show the commitment of the Charter in the picture. And the last one, uh, is actually a website that sh where deaf people can, and sign language users in this case, can share information of events that are accessible or made by them for sign language user, etc. And that is a place where people can share information, so it's very useful. So. so, interesting enough, the core value of these seems to be solidarity. <laughs> okay, good luck to me to finish off in five minutes. Okay, fair enough. I'll try my best. Uh, so now I'm sharing, uh, the, sorry, I'm projecting the image of the standard deviation, which means how much the deaf community have uh, 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 agreed with the uh, cultural crown and how much variation within that community there was to what the cultural crown was proposing. So obviously, the closer to the cultural crown, the curve would have been a vertical curve, and the more the, the, the flatter the curve was, the more diversification there was in the responses from the deaf community. I'm now projecting a table with lots of uh, numbers that indicate the standard deviations and the responses of happiness and uh, kindness. I'm not going through all of them, but what is important is of all those five pictures, uh, is that th this seems that there is a very close agreement with the, the the cultural crown from deaf people, but even more from the hearing side the, of the respondents. They are part of the deaf community. So it seems that hearing people have better knowledge and they seem to be more congruent, so they're agreeing more with what it was presented by the cultural crown. So. Uh, again, it shows hearing privilege, so even within the deaf community, hearing people that are part of the deaf community, for whatever reason, seems to be still in a position of privilege, uh, because they have access to identity, culture, history, that some member of the deaf community had not access to. So these things do not get taught in schools. Okay, they get passed on but hearing people can learn about those things in the education. Deaf people tend not to. So this leads to the conversation about colonialism, our identity being colonized, uh, and uh, how the information that we receive, the, the ideas that we have is externally controlled, okay, the lack of independence of some individuals within the deaf community. So another interesting point was that uh, historically uh, many authors have given importance to deaf clubs, uh, centers, uh, buildings, uh, monuments, something that actually we found out in this uh, survey that deaf people were giving importance to the people that went to those clubs, to the people that participated in those events, but not to the buildings as historical importance was given. And also the, the value of the people that and they were more, uh, and, and regardless of their status as well. So people were considered equally to some extent. So I had a very different 
perception myself when I came into this research. And actually, that was a quite interesting finding for me because so much has been given importance to that actually didn't necessarily come through this survey. Uh, there was also a number of photo photographs that were introduced in the survey that the cultural crown knew that would have instigated an ambiguous response. So they knew that deaf people would have responded differently, depending on their experiences, their feelings towards some of these representations that are in contained in the pictures. So one is Action on Hearing Loss, for example, which is an organization that services uh, for deaf people. One is Dot T Cafes, which is a, a, a hearing run cafe that provides certain services and employ deaf people. And uh, one was a British deaf, sorry, the uh, Sussex Deaf Association that was established and run by missioners for the deaf initially, and then eventually still by hearing people for deaf people. And the last picture is a picture of deaf children going through a lesson based on headsets and the teacher is using a microphone and they're doing uh, reading skills and also uh, speech therapy at the same time. So the result from the community is that they couldn't agree if these were kind, uh, they, they instigated kindness uh, reaction or happiness reaction. So obviously deaf people saw some of these as imperialistic representations, so hearing people or giving services for deaf people. And then for some deaf people, they saw these as very kind things that hearing people do as nice and kind as they are to help deaf people. So again, some were very, uh, uh, very felt very strongly about it, hearing people tried to control us, and again, we've got the opposite opinion in the other side. So we've been abused in some of the cases and like in the one of the picture, so the teacher is actually abusive because in some cases they put fingers in our mouth, they turn their heads and physically uh, manipulated us to teach us and other people said, oh well that was the only way that the teacher could teach us how to speak. So. So again, the uh, picture at the moment is again the one uh, about uh, the deaf education and we do have uh, the response for deaf people is virtually four, which is the medium, but actually the hearing people responded that they were slightly more against, so in disagreement, of, so this not, it was not unhappy picture for the view of the hearing people within the deaf community. So again, it's interesting how hearing people seems to be more in agreement that this is not a happy moment for those deaf kids, and deaf people instead themselves couldn't really justify that. So for some of them it was, and for some of them it wasn't. So again, they couldn't find an agreement about that setting And then, sorry, I'm, I'm going over time. Uh, so <laughs> we are talking about cultural identity and there were a number of uh, pictures that were trying to capture. Uh, and we thought originally that some of these pictures, there is a deaf history, deaf utopia, etc., deaf club, and deaf pubs would have been given a, a major importance in these surveys and actually they were not. So they were not as important as we thought they would have been. So again, some people didn't know how to look at them, so what he meant for them, and therefore they couldn't respond effectively to those questions. So they were not sure if a picture of a deaf school was in the 1950s gave them, although it was of historical value, gave them a sense of happiness or not. So just in order, uh, sorry if I, um, again, will wind uh, come to an end. So just to say what uh, my uh, response to this is, is that there is obviously a sphere of reach that deaf 
people within the deaf community might or might not have, or it might be more larger than others for some of them, okay? So uh, it depends on how aware of the culture of the language and skills, and this could go from the neighborhood, meaning the people that go to their clubs and then home, etc. people that can navigate the cities, people that can participate at regional level, a national level, or even at global diaspora, so internationally. <clears throat> so again, it depends on what opportunity they had to learn or to participate and to be part of sharing events. Uh, again, they can choose, the more they have disability and skills, the more they can choose to be part of it or not. So interesting enough, there was a sense of, uh, uh, sorry, the interpreter just asked John not to speed up uh, just for a second. Uh, uh, so there was a, a question about how comfortable they were for those that found themselves in the neighborhood, if they were okay with it, if they were happy with it, or if they felt they were constrained from external factor in that position. And the response at the moment that we've got from them was that they were seems to be happy in that position. They were not uh, upset about it. <coughs> so the issue is that they don't have the skill, the skill set and the capacity to change that situation as well compared to other individuals that have a larger outreach in this sphere of reach. So the more knowledge you have uh, of language, of culture, etc., the larger your sphere of reach seems to have been. So in the other hand of the scales, we've got the global diaspora, which is, where is it, those individuals that can actually not only know one's own language, but they're comfortable in communicating with different with deaf people from other countries, whether because they know another sign language or because they're comfortable in adjusting their communication skills to meet that of others. And all those knowledge and skills about their cultures and, and the barriers obviously are lim uh, uh, reduced and therefore they can travel more, they can meet more and they can learn more. And the more they learn, the more the global uh, outreach or sphere for them becomes. So for me to talk about culture mobility is not, so is the more important things for the deaf community seems to me based in this research rather than social mobility as people seem to be focusing on, which is not reflected in the deaf community. And I guess I'll stop there. I think that was a nice ending to my and apologies for going over time. Okay, thank you. Yes, absolutely. So, what a fantastic lineup of people talking about interesting things. So, we just got a few minutes. So, I wonder if the four speakers would just like to sit at the front and we can just have a few minutes of general discussion and questions from anybody about anything. So if you just like to, so Lorraine and Maria and Atif, uh, we probably need to wrap, oh, thanks. Yeah, 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 no, of course. So people who need to go, of course, uh, do go. It's getting, getting late, but fantastic. So there are a few people still around. Um, some people have to leave. So does anyone have any questions? So Dilmarad, just we've got a couple of people. So Atif, do you want to come and take a seat? Well, we'll use this microphone because that seems to be more effective. Um, so, so we've got Lorraine, Atif, Maria, and John uh, going from left to right. Okay, so Dilmarad, did you want to kick off? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I just wanted to say thanks to John, and I really loved uh, the way he did the research and the, how it was like very creative way of researching. I, I think 
when you when you started your presentation with the theme that like uh, deaf community as a global diaspora, I, I also kind of felt um, you use. Um, I'm also looking into how deaf people in Uzbekistan, I don't know how, how Uzbekistan is in BSL, <laughs> but... Um, it's in USL, surely. Yeah, yes. But uh, people in, in my country, for example, they don't use deaf with D capital, and they don't uh, think of themselves as an ethnic minority uh, with its own like culture and language. And it's very difficult, I think, because deaf people, there are many ways of being deaf uh, in, 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 in different parts of the world. And I wanted to ask you whether uh, there is a kind of a, you, you are talking about global diaspora. Uh, is it possible to have it with all kind of different sets of values? And like, for example, in the United States, uh, being deaf is very difficult, different and radical compared to in, in my country, for example, people, people don't think that they are kind of deaf with D capital. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, it's interesting that you brought it up because that would be the next step for my research because obviously I need to do now a comparative piece of work because I'm talking about diaspora, but I can't focus on one place only and make it a diaspora. So obviously I need to still uh, research for patterns in other places. So thank you for raising that because that's, you know, is an alarm bell for me as well. So yes, um, uh, with education, training, it is possible to inspire deaf people in other countries to find their own identity like they have in South Africa or in other, uh, you know, in South Africa, obviously things were run by white people, etc. So even when it comes to uh, different uh, ethnicities, etc., the same things apply for some deaf people as well. So, and also to see the narratives of uh, other deaf people. So if you bring the narrative of other deaf people around the world to those in that country, you may find that some of these could influence. The problem is that sometimes, the problem is that sometimes in certain countries, who have made decision for them is not themselves. Okay, lady of the stripy jumper, here comes the microphone for you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So my question goes to Maria. Um, so I don't know if if you covered that in the whole presentation, but. I um, just like a follow up to the question, um, the question someone asked about the reasons why some of the children died, and you mentioned malnutrition, and then also that that kind of like be related to poverty. Um, I was wondering, apart from creating a space for the caregivers to like creating a support system for the caregivers, the the program you do kind of like address the economic empowerment of these caregivers as well because I feel like that's also really important. You know, so like, did the project by any means try to help the caregivers economically to be empowered? So which would kind of also feed into them being able to provide better nutrition and healthcare and all that for the children. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> Uh, thanks. So the straight answer is no, um, but it is um, a key issue that uh, is a priority for the group. I mean, one of the, the programme wanted to strengthen linkages. So um, if it was run in the upper east of Ghana, it was embedded within a C, there was a CBR programme going on with some livelihoods work. So the, the women were supposed to be linked into those programmes. Um, I don't think that really happened. Um, it's not something that we evaluated, but um, from the qualitative, we didn't really see that happen. In other, in other areas, it was part of inclusive primary care. The program ran within a attached to inclusive primary health care program, so there was no livelihoods component. So it is a massive issue, um, and it's a priority for us at the moment to look at how that can be addressed better. So thank you for that. 
Any other? Oh, yes. Hi. Hi hello. Um, my name's Matthew from the I'm an MA student here um, with uh, Power Participation and Social Change. Uh, my question is regarding data collection and um, how the, my concern, I guess, is in regards to the SDGs and how in 2030 we're going to assess the success of our um, tackling issues in regard to disability if we're, not, uh, if we're not collecting the data on people with disability. Um, just an open question, really, to the panel. Really. Uh, not a question, really, just a discussion point. So I can actually answer the question, but I mean, uh, I, there is, uh, there are some uh, individual, uh, particularly in education, there are some indicators where we're looking at parity, but so in terms of education outcomes, in terms of in equality, in terms of um, access, some access, and, but I mean, if we think about how long the SDGs have now been in action. We're still debating what the, what the particular um, things that we're supposed to be tracking will actually look like. So we've already lost however many years. Um, I think there is at least uh, some um, awareness now and governments like our government, DFYD, is pushing for more individual programs and projects to be accountable. And I think the UN just has launched its new strategy. Um, so we've got, we've got pockets of potentially influential agencies, um, some governments as well. It, it, it's sort of slowly becoming more obvious that we need to track these things. The exact details of what we're tracking, though, is still you know, to be decided, dot, dot, dot. Um, but at least people are talking about it, and that's, that's new. So we've made one step forward, definitely. Um, I think also it's just about getting out, talking about it, making sure that we are asking the questions and spreading you know, the knowledge and just, just asking people um, to disaggregate as much as possible. I'll just add something. I think um, a lot of people before disability was included in the SDGs. I mean, it's obviously it's not mentioned in all 17 of them, but in some of them. If you point out to people that some of the goals are not going to be, able to, going to be met because of disabled people not getting what they need, people are quite shocked. So if you say, you know, you can't, you can have a goal about all children in being in school and the biggest group of children who are not in school are disabled children, then people look quite shocked and they go, oh, I didn't know that, that was the... So that goal is going to fail because the disabled children aren't, aren't in school. So if you put it like that and you start to get a bit of traction from people. Um, but also, we were talking before this seminar started about DFID and how DFID are now putting a disability aspect into every programme that they fund. And so that's making people sit up and think. It's giving us more work to do, actually, because, you know... But, you know, whereas they now automatically put a gender aspect into everything and nobody would question that... Now, for you know, if they're doing a project on water and sanitation, they put a disability in aspect. We're suddenly getting calls from people saying, "We are doing this water and sanitation thing, and we've got to do disability. W w w can you help us?" You know, so and of course, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a specific disabilities team to do that. But that there's a transition stage where we need to help people to make that. So it, you know, it's happening slowly but surely. So we can use it as a mechanism to actually raise awareness. It's not yeah. Like a yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. We'd like to put ourselves out of business, really, you know, if the whole world was inclusive. Yes. Um, I just had a question. I think it's probably to Lorraine and Atif. Uh, have, I, have I said your name? <laughs> um, as far as accessible online surveys or universally accessible online surveys, I mean, I've never been able to fill out an NS uh, national student survey or a staff survey or any of these things, and most of my, my disabled peers have never been able to either because they're not accessible with disability software, they're not in Braille, you can't do them over the phone, all these sorts of things. Um, does one exist? Because if, you know, the higher education authority can't get it right, do we even have one? Atif, is that for you? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think there's one document. I did, there isn't a system. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd be up for really hearing that and I'd be stunned. Um, I, I think that the idea is what is good practice and defining that, you know, and, and be agile enough for people to say, well, actually, it's not good enough. Um, and if I said to a room, hands up who sent an accessible document in the last month, <coughs> it would all be liars, right? Because <laughs> we haven't, even if we use accessibility checker, because we're going to meet people that says, well, this hasn't worked for me, you know, for so many reasons. But it's whether we are building, I, you know, if I say, are we building a culture of anticipating that and making sure that we're open to the spaces that says, look, inform your process by, by, by asking this question. Are people, and what are we missing when we aren't getting that data, when we're not getting those surveys right? What do we miss? Because we've made it just too damn hard unnecessarily. Um, yeah. yeah. <coughs> I, I like, uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, our culture is to do things on the phone to make sure to set up calls and to fill out forms with people over the phone, but, but it's to ask, but that's not necessarily always enough, and not everybody wants to, to do that as well. So, so it's, it's, uh, how do I explain? When I do interviews with people, I ever give it questions a day in advance. I find that if I give it two days in advance, people overthink it and really worry. But I think people should have questions, and we ask, what would you like, like, to get this job? I, I'm just, if, 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 you, you, you can go for a walk. You, we want, we're not here to catch you out. We're here to get the best of you in the short time that we get to make those kind of judgments. But in this space, you'll spend more time with us than you will with your friends and family, your hobbies, what you love. What are we doing that's enough to make you want to do that? And it's building parity, I guess, to say, does person have agency and voice and a sense of belonging to say, I want to be part of this? I want to say this could be better. And they're really asking me, not just tokenistically. Does that, yeah. does that help? Um, there isn't one document, though, I just think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. I think you really, I think you really should stop uh, because it is after 7 o'clock. I'm sure you've all got homes to go to. Um, and uh, we might get locked into the building if we stay too much longer. Um, so thank you very much. A small but perfectly formed group of speakers and a small and perfectly formed group of audience as well. So thank you very much for coming. And um, if you wanted to put your name on our list, we will circulate ne you next time we have an event. We're hoping to have some kind of disability-related seminar two or three times a year, um, as and when we can get them together. So if you've put your name on that list, we'll assume you want to be told about that. So thank you very much. And do eat more cake if you want to, because there's loads of it at the back. Thank you. A big round of applause for everybody.